Should we begin? Yes, I can hear. Can you all hear? I can hear. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank Elliott Bay Book Company for hosting this event. And I want to thank Karen Allman and Rick Simonson for uh, their opening remarks and for doing a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to get this event running. I want to also acknowledge that we're, I happen to be at the University of Washington where I've done so much work and thinking and writing with regard to this book is on Coast Salish lands. And I also want to, you know, just acknowledge all of the colleagues and students and friends who've been part of the thinking of this project for years that I've developed it. I, you know, constantly have books and conversations in mind when it comes to uh, thinking about this book and it's out in the world and it's, you know, part of, you know, in a sense, this very rich community of other thinking that has been so much a part of the process of writing it. I'd like to thank, of course, Stephanie Smallwood and Margo Crawford, my interlocutors who have been so generous to give their time and to be a part of the process of thinking about this book in their own ways. And so it's just such a pleasure to be in your company, albeit virtually. And thank you all for attending this talk. I appreciate your presence, especially given the hour for some of you on the East Coast, including Margot. So I'm going to begin, you know, by you know, talking a little bit about the book, the development of it, the impetus for it. I'll read a passage or two from it just to kind of get us started. And then the three of us will have a, a conversation about some of the themes, you know, around the book, you know. So, so, you know, that's how we'll proceed. And so what I want to begin by saying that this book is really, in a lot of ways, the product of the last decade. You know, the decade of the 20. 10s was really turbulent in a lot of ways. And I think that the my feeling of it, my experience of it, was one of a breaking off of one set of possibilities, one set of assumptions and ways of experiencing the world, and an opening up of something else. And so in a sense, this book comes out of attempting to account for what I felt was an inflection point. It may be no surprise that part of the way my thinking about this project developed had to do with tracking the presidency of the first black man to be the president of the United States, right? The Obama administration. I had no intention of writing about the Obama administration. Uh, my first book ends with it, but there is something that I found myself doing in the years of his presidency that was kind of informal. It wasn't something that was part of my thinking about this book, but it had to do with the way that his presidency sort of evoked or conjured up or exploited the iconicity of elderly Black women. And so this begins with a speech he gives at the very beginning of his presidency. It's the victory speech he gives in 2008, where he evokes a 106-year-old Anne Dixon Cooper, who through all of the early years of the 20th century, endures to finally vote for the first Black president. And of course, you can understand the symbolic import of that story, right? That her long life is, in some ways, the you know conveyance of history that culminates in the end of history, right? Which is the full, um, you know, the the full endowment of citizenship granted to people, which is what Obama's administration seemed to symbolize, right? It's this aspiration of full personhood, of full citizenship, that then comes to fruition, and so that idea of fruition seemed to you know, infuse the 2010s, at least in those early years. And so you know, other images that from Obama conferring the Presidential Medal of Freedom onto Toni Morrison, um, you know, the way he evoked 
the importance of uh, this other elderly woman. I mean, he repeats the same gesture in the 2013 State of the Union Address with Desilene Victor. She's this tremendously elderly woman who, who endures a lot, who eventually votes, right? So electoral politics, Obama himself, come to stand in for the end of a particular trajectory when it comes to Black politics and the fulfillment of a kind of promise of personhood, of citizenship. And it's not an accident that that fulfillment is Black masculinity, but the symbolic, you know, sort of iconography that kind of is granted to that masculine achievement is elderly Black womanhood. So this became kind of this informal preoccupation of mine, like why Black women as the conveyors of history? What is it about elderly Black women that seems appropriate for symbolizing history for all of us, right? That's a kind of labor that's not granted to all kinds of persons, right? And so I was thinking about this. And then in 2012, there's a lynching of a 17 year old boy. And so with regard to the death of Trayvon Martin, everything changed. And it seemed like the conversation went from what some had called this post-racial moment, right? We finally achieved the end of this trajectory toward full citizenship. We've gotten there. It's been aspirational for a long time and we finally reached the end to this moment where the conversation was about, not only have we not reached full citizenship, full personhood, full humanity, but we know that we haven't because even the most innocent among us, those who are objectively most deserving of protection are still being killed in the streets. And so that conversation was framed in terms of age. As you may remember, the refrain that many people made, it wasn't new, but people repeated it with a revitalized urgency, was that Black children are denied a childhood. And that was true of Trayvon. It was true of Tamir Rice. It was true of Michael Brown. It was true of numerous, numerous others. And so I thought that this shift from the full achievement of manhood, right, Obama himself, to the focus on Black children was an interesting way of thinking about the end of one era, the beginning of another, and this question of what exactly age means when it comes into contact with Blackness. How exactly has age in some ways been constituted through Blackness? How have they been jointly constituted? And what exactly does age signify? Because it certainly doesn't signify just, uh, you know, the normative mode of, um, you know, the way we think about age as a way of tracking the schedule of rights, for instance, or the way we think about development, or the way we think about just biological growth, right? The natural political, philosophical, evolutionary ways in which we think about age somehow are suspended or they're to some degree converted into something else at the site of Blackness. And so this is what I wanted to explore. How is it that Black children are denied childhood? How is it that elderly Black women are the conveyors of histories that go back to time immemorial. How is it that we think about the way embodiment, Black embodiment, could be thought of as not having an age? And so the question, why aren't Black children seen as children, really prompted me to ask, when are Black people of any age seen as the ages that they are, or more significantly, when is normative age attributed to Blackness? And so that becomes the beginning point for 
uh, my explorations throughout this book. The book thinks in terms of the literary imagination. I'm interested in the way that when we get to the 20th century in particular, and when the Black literary imagination is taking up in a really robust way, questions about the historical past, and in particularly with regard to enslavement, I'm interested in the way that that exploration of the past utilizes this historical problem in order to either provide an alternative account of historical abuses, the way, that with the, with the way in which the development of the Western modern world produced a set of violences that had to do with the accumulation of capital in varying ways, right? The way in which people are transformed into commodities, the way that conquest, conquest requires the dispossession of land, the way that bodies are dispossessed of time, right? I think that age in the literary imagination is providing an alternative history that accounts for that violence that is very much a part of and comes out of the development of Western modernity. And at the same time, it's producing an all set, a set of alternatives, which are about reclaiming something, right? And I think that act of reclamation is really reaching toward an alternative version of being human. It's a version of humanity that doesn't include what I call patriarchal adulthood, but also human time insofar as time itself, when it's applied to embodiment, is that which is understood through the reason of man. If we can think of adulthood, right, the pinnacle of being not just a legal person, right? Not just being the ultimate, you know, version of rational, you know, sort of citizen, but also of being the ultimate version of human. If we can think of adulthood as something that isn't that, then you really would have to be thinking about an alternative version of being human. And so in that sense, I'm interested in what the alternatives to the version of humanity that we have, have been imagined as. And so with that, I'll read one section from the book that I think speaks to that. Hopefully it's not too long so that we can really kind of begin a conversation. Um, but I do want to kind of try to give you a sense of, of if I can find it here of how I've been thinking about it. So one other thing I should say in terms of my thinking of this book, you know, has to do with the way that gender has been an important structuring uh, sort of concept, right? A sort of framing for how Black Studies has for quite some time now thought about alternatives to the human. And so Horton Spiller's work, right? Our great philosopher Horton Spiller's becomes really important for my thinking. I go back to the 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, to think about how she's thinking about ungendering at the site of the Atlantic Ocean. That site where on the one hand, we do get this kind of sign of Western violence that not only transforms human beings into cargo and that not only transforms them as such, but also becomes an example of capital's accumulation that then produces a set of fantasies that have to do with dividing people from other people, right? So in a sense, you have this division that separates cargo and commodities from the actual humans, right? And so it's that idea of separation that occurs by virtue of the logics of capitalism, racial capitalism, that the, the oceanic, the Atlantic Ocean in particular signifies, but there's also an undoing that's gendered as Spillers explains, but also has to do with age. Once you're transformed into cargo, no longer are you a child, 
no longer are you a female, right? No longer are you male. No longer are you an adult. No longer are you aged in the sense that these are all social categories. You've now been undone to a level of flesh, which I argue has an untimeliness to it. And it's that untimeliness, the untimeliness of the flesh that is the vector toward an alternative humanism that goes beyond and defies man's reason. So with that, I'll just read a little bit from the book and hopefully we will get into a conversation. So since history only properly exists as history, when it constitutes, reifies and uh, fortifies Western humanism, I think of it as belonging to an assemblage of Western epistemologies that together comprise what I refer to as human time. That assemblage includes Western modernity's epistemic structures of time, the developmental and evolutionary time of ontology, of ontology, excuse me, and phylogeny, the political uh, philosophical time of liberal humanism, and the overarching historical time of civilization. The very concept of age, which has been naturalized to such a degree that to speak of it at all requires a reliance on Western modernity's knowledge and reason, is in fact the embodied consolidation of human time. Signifying and manifesting humanness overall, Age expresses how humans exist in a hegemonic, timely temporality that operates on numerous scales, which range from the individual to the universal. The human matures individually and in synchronicity with chronological, calendrical time. The human develops along with liberalism's teleology so that one grows into being a fully developed liberal subject endowed with social, economic, and political obligations, along with social protections and privileges. The scheduling of rights, privileges, and protections is mapped onto a schema of biological, chronological, and social human development. So the precise number of years lived make up the schedule. But even with the realm of the human, a legal schedule of rights has failed to capture fully the maturation of anyone other than the liberal humanist subject par excellence, who is implicitly white, heteronormative, and male. And then I'll just read one more section before we open it up. So if Matt Richardson, my theorist Matt Richardson, puts it, black bodies are unknowable under the schema of a two gender system, then I would add that black bodies have been unknowable through the schema of linear normative life stages and lifespans. Ultimately, age points to the threshold of alternative humanity by thinking of temporality, not only as it is related to history's teleology or wreckages, sweeping epochal or epistemic shifts, but as flesh. Spillers famously indicates this when she contends that the violent subjection of Africans crossing the Middle Passage has left a kind of hieroglyphics of the flesh whose severe disjunctures come to be hidden to the cultural seeing by skin color. In other words, black don't crack. Across time and generations, skin and age express something other, something about our inhuman, our inhumanity that is unseen, unwritten, and unspoken. Black age is a framework for epistemologically challenging what counts as human time and uncovering the infinite ways in which Black life matters.
And so we can begin. Thank you, Habiba, for writing this book. This is a book that Black Studies simply needs. And I want to say, and partially because I love everything you do with Toni Morrison's last novel, God Help the Child. So I want to bring in Toni Morrison as I hold your book now and say, look where my hands are now. I think the first... Um, the first genuine question I have for you, Habib, and I, I wonder, I've been thinking about why it lingers for me, that moment when you say uh, something along the lines of, let me restate, oceanic is my term. And this is even when, as you've already explained, right, when you're working so beautifully with Hortense Spillers, and of course, also holding on to Freud, but you also then pause and you make it clear as you move to this very idea of untimely Black age, that you want Oceanic to signal something that is a bit different even from what Spillers has delivered. And so I would love, you know, thinking even about your writing process, um, to hear more about why Oceanic, why that word, and everything mm -hmm. you want to do. Mm, thank you so much, Margo. I'm so glad that you brought us to what is in a sense the crux for me. And you're right, Spillers gives us everything, right? I mean, we really don't need to depart from what she gives us. We can just take it and in a sense rework it and extend it and expound upon it as we do, right? I take it in order to you know, number one, really amplify what she's doing with that concept. I don't want to replace it, which I, I hope is clear, you know. Um, you know but I want to hold two things at once, right? On the one hand, what I see as so generative in the way that she uses that term, right? When we think about being in the nowhere of the oceanic, she's giving us Freud on his head, right? So in a sense, if Freud is saying, that the oceanic feeling is this regressive sense that adults, fully adults, right? Fully normative adults, not abnormal adults, right? Normal adults feel when they have this sense of religiosity that attaches their sense of being to the being of others, right? Being connected to something larger than yourself is partly how Freud is thinking about the oceanic feeling, right? It's that sense of non-differentiation that defies the ego. And in that sense, it's regressive, right? But in being so, it also carries a connotation of racialization. Because we know that when it comes to evolutionary science, when it comes to Freud's own commitments to recapitulationist theory, that there's this idea that development happens on different biological scales and on different psychical scales. And to think of the oceanic as being this regressive feeling because it's non-differentiated is a way of saying that there's something about it that is racialized, I would say, right? So he's evoking age when he's speaking about this kind of religiosity that he doesn't quite understand, right? And so I'm picking that up from Spillers. She's giving us this when she's locating the, 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 the transformation of socially contextual human beings as cargo on the slave ship in the Atlantic Ocean, right? That to be in that nowhere space is not only to be separated from a social context in which your humanness makes sense, it's also in some ways to be undone because you're non-differentiated in terms of human time, right? So there's no, th that non-differentiation cuts off, it forecloses the possibility of a kind of, you know, existence of an ego that would then define adulthood, which is the pinnacle of, of humanity, right? So I think of that happening with Spiller's use of the oceanic. She's bringing it into this question of what does it mean to be non-differentiated and human at the same time, right? That's not how Western modernity thinks about what it means to be human. You can be differentiated. You could be an individual and as an individual, 
you could be recognized as a citizen. And as a citizen, you could have property and property, all of these concepts that we attach to liberal humanism are about individuation, are about separating the individual from the other, right? So that idea of being non-differentiated is attached to this question of not be, you know, this is what I'm taking from her, right? Is not being able to be fully individual, to not be able to grow as a full individual, but also not to be able to be a full adult, right? I mean, the oceanic for Freud is what children are, what infants are. When the baby, right, that is still in some ways pre-ego, right, the pre-ego stage of infancy is what the oceanic non-differentiation means for Freud, right? It's when the infant is still connected to the mother to the degree that the infant can't understand the difference between itself and the mother, right? That the needs are still met by this other figure and there's no differentiation there. So non-differentiation was infantile, right? So Spillers gives us, I mean, not to belabor that particular aspect of it, but she does give us a way of thinking about not only the, un the ungendering that occurs by virtue of the violence of transatlantic transport, but also of the foreclosure not only of differentiation and individuation, but of also the adulthood that's implied in that. The other reason I go to it, and to some degree, you know, attempt to make this concept my own is because I want to bring the idea of the oceanic into conversation with the fantasies and ideologies that stem out of racial capitalism. So if we're thinking about this non-differentiation, then we have to think about how non-differentiation is in some ways um, the opposite of what racial capitalism produces, right? Racial capitalism separates us. In a sense, it's a technology to separate human beings or groups of humans from shared investments, shared histories, shared ways of understanding our own liberation. Right. So, you know, it's also a separating device when it comes to thinking about how we're related to particular versions of land. Right. The way we think about our connections to particular ways of knowing and ways of being. So the way that racial capitalism gives forth this imaginary, this imaginary space that then gets in some ways translated as racial. Right, because that separation becomes possible if you think of it in terms of unequal scales of value. So if you have, for instance, as a result of you know, the kinds of separations that occur, you have those who conquer, right? You have those who enslave, and then you have those who are conquered, right? You have those who conquer land and those who are dispossessed of it. You have those who enslave people and those who are enslaved, right? In a sense, that's part of the schema that you know, racial capitalism produces. So that division or that you know, particular division that needs to happen in order or that happens as a result of accumulation of capital, right? That in a sense, is also what's being remarked upon, I feel, in this question of non-differentiation. I feel that what I wanted to bring to the fore by in some ways making this concept something of my own is the way that non-differentiation really cuts against the relationality that I attempt to imagine in this book. That if we can imagine how we're related to each other in ways that have been prevented to, you know, have been prevented by virtue of the ideological ways in which we think of human capacity or the way in which we think of hierarchies of value when it comes to human being, or the way we think about hierarchies of capacities, which are racialized. If we can think about our connections as 
non-differentiated, right, in some ways, then it not only gives us what Spillers is giving us in terms of turning to Freud and turning the racialized history of Freudian psychoanalysis on its head, it's also giving us an answer and a, a response to what racial capitalism gives forth in the way of a set of imaginaries that we continue to live in in this very day. So that's why I think of the oceanic and why I wanted to kind of put a fine point on the fact that, you know, we're talking about the transatlantic slave trade, right? We're talking about a particular regime that is very much a part of the development of the Western modern world. And one that has a lot to do with the way in which we think about our capacity to either think of our connections or not think of them. And so that's, that's kind, I hope that answers the question, Margot, does it? It truly right. does, it truly does. And, and I wanna say, cause I know Stephanie wants to jump in but I just wanna say very, very quickly that part of what for me becomes the beauty of how you and Horton Spillers are in conversation. It also then, Habiba, makes me think so much about in terms of the non-differentiated, how then when we think about everything that we could think of in terms of how adulthood can't be a part of that non-differentiated, then we um, can think about how Spillers' very idea of oneness is also what you're building on in a way that's very similar to what Kevin Kwashi builds on. Mm. So I think that beautiful Spillers energy everywhere in this book. And so I also, of course, could ask a similar question about untimely, how that word also is something that you want us to hear and how you want to set in motion in so many ways. But Stephanie, I know you want to jump in. <laughs> I do want to jump in and I'm going to jump in and pick up right on the thread that you introduced, Margo, because I do want to foreground or just um, reiterate, Habiba, how much I do think that what's so rich about what you do here is to build on Spillers. Spillers gives us the ungendered, but you really are um, just so powerfully illuminating how equally important is this this, this, this process, this, this operation of, of unaging, right? Um, of, of, and so to Margo's next question, I, I would love to hear you say more about your concept of untimeliness, but I also wanted to ask you, um, one of the things that's most compelling for me about the way you lay out the conceptual framework for the book is that you talk about immediately running into a problem of method. And I wanted to hear more about your, I wanted to know more about your process in terms of how you entered the project understanding what it was that you were after with age as this category, because, you know, it seems to me that, you know, given what we know about the, the gendered, the heteronormative, the racial hegemonies, that structure Western liberal humanism, you know, arguably it's not a surprise that a project looking for evidence of black age, you know, for self-evident expression of the ways racial capitalism's abuses and violence uh, distort the black human's experience of, you know, the embodiment, the staging of a life. Um, it's not it's not a surprise that there's a methodological conundrum there. And so I feel like, you know, what you do is it's brilliant to turn to age as an epistemological and analytic category, as opposed to wanting to use it as a kind of empirical category for the production of evidence. And I guess what I'm wondering is, did you know from the outset that the task was going to be to treat age as an analytic category, or is that something that you encountered along the way? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I did know that I couldn't treat it empirically. I mean, part of that has to do with my own training. Um, you know, like if I were to, you know, sort of uh, do a different kind of 
of research, I, I might have attempted to, to come up with a project that treated age in some you know, more properly empirical way. I knew I couldn't do that by dint of training. I also knew I couldn't do it because of the scale of the, of the topic, right? So, I mean, part of, it works as an analytic, you know, maybe I'll just kind of approach it this way because it allows us to see other aspects of the way our particular present has been constituted. And so that's part of what I wanted to accomplish with this work. I knew that to some degree, age, because of the way I encounter it, right? Right in the smack middle or really the early 2010s, there's something about this particular social category that's making time feel out of joint. Right, that there's something about it that's suddenly Emmett Till is coming back into the frame. Right, I mean, the way that people were comparing Trayvon Martin to Emmett Till became notable. Right, suddenly we're, we're we had the first black president and now we're back in 1955. Right, and so in some ways, I wanted to account for how exactly social categories come to be, right? So in some ways, it's a, a kind of history of the present. And in that sense, you know, it becomes useful as an analytic for at least attempting to understand, you know, precisely how historical categories are constituted and how they appear in the present. And so in that way, I, I wanted to think about, or at least attempt, to think about how this category is meaningful on varying scales, right? So age is something that we understand in very personal ways. We all have lived through varying life stages. You know, in some ways we have investments about the way life stages are understood socially because of our want to protect people in our communities, our own children, right? Elderly people, people who in some ways are vulnerable and perhaps age factors into this. But I also wanted to think about how age is constitutive of the Western modern human being. And to that end, right? I mean, to, to think in that sense would require thinking philosophically, perhaps, um, you know, in addition to thinking historically. And so that's something that I know I could do if I think of age as an analytic. It allows me to be flexible with regard to the methods I do use in order to explore this topic. And so, you know, I really kind of wanted to think if we do away with the meanings of the social categories of age, if we do away with what it means to be a child in a normative sense, if we do away with what it means to be an adult in the normative sense, what are we able to think in that case? We're able to think about protection differently. We're able to think about our value differently. We're able to think about our shared humanity differently, right? It's not enough to kind of think about what would it mean if Trayvon Martin was thought of as a normatively recognizable boy, right? What if he was seen as a child? That would be important, right? But it also would exclude some other people who may not meet that standard, right? That there's something exclusionary about the way in which age has been constituted socially. And so if we think about that and really think about it seriously and then attempt to not only think about the constitution of that historically and philosophically, but then imagine alternatives to it, you really do have to, you know, go to a terrain that's far more conceptual and conjectural than empirical, right? And so in that sense, I, I knew that I couldn't write an empiricist study about age. And I, I knew that in some ways, you know, that's not what the Black literary imagination does, right? I mean, because so much of my thinking is drawn from the literary, it's drawn from culture, it's drawn from the aesthetic, that to go to the art, right, and to kind of see what's been imagined, this is this, this is, this imagining is coming out of Black life, right? I mean, and so I wanted to really take that seriously. Mm -hmm. And can I just say that I thought another 
way of really understanding the brilliance of this book is precisely what you just said, the way that you continually, <clears throat> you continue to think about the unthought of, and I love the way you even use that phrase, Habiba, the unthought of, because especially when you're attending to Black girlhood, I feel that there's a way in which with some of the writers and clearly with Morrison, on the one hand, you are making us all remain as excited about the ways in which Morrison in Sula, in Pakola, in Buisai with Pakola, the way in which there's a certain thought of girlhood. But then when you turn to God help the child and this move to uh, what you know you phrase as the unthought of, and especially I would say, and this is a partially even, I hope a way to pull even more readers into your book, everything you do with Equiano, I think in terms of thinking about the unnamed sister and everything that you're naming and not naming when you refer to her, right, as the Equiano girl. And that's clearly, you know, that moment when you're making it so crystal clear that we have to think about, I mean, don't you call it that at one point that liminal space, right, where representation doesn't quite work. And that's when, of course, you continue to think of it in terms of what is unthought. And so absolutely, if that was your goal, you achieve it. <laughs> you know, when you think about what you just said. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margot. I mean, and you know, of course, there's room for empirical work, right? I mean, in a sense, I far far be it for me, I would never say that the kind of work that really looks for the girls in the archive, right? For instance, is important. We right, I mean, in a sense, like that kind of work is important. It's we need it all. It's just that, you know, I am kind of interested in thinking about, you know, in, in that. You know, in that moment when I'm going to Equiano's memoir or autobiography, you know, his, his narrative, I'm attempting to take this figure which really isn't thought of, you know, thank you for reminding me of it, Margo. Like there's, there's really not a lot, you know, in the work about what that figure might mean for rethinking the particular moment of early Western modernity in Equiano's text, right? I mean, so in a sense, we think of Equiano in a number of ways. I mean, really, to think of that particular version of, you know, the enslaved turned liberal person is very much a narrative that tracks onto the way we think of the development of liberalism, right? And in some ways, that is. Uh, precisely how that autobiography is meant to work in some, um, you know, kind of historical way. So the, the tracking of Equiano's own development from not only boyhood to adulthood, but from the enslaved to the free subject, right? Both of those are meant to be not just parallel, but, you know, overlapping, right? And that's part of the ideological work it's doing as a narrative about liberalism. If you focus on his sister, who's also, we're told, taken from their homeland, we don't know what happens to her once she's taken, right? I mean, she encounters Equiano very briefly. They're both separated as children. They're both taken at the same time. They're separated during the first passage, that passage from their homeland across you know, the continent to the coast where we know Equiano is transported, but we have no idea whether his sister, right, if she existed, is transported across the Atlantic. So in a sense, I kind of think of my reading of that particular text as one that does allow us to, you know, we talked about the Atlantic at the beginning, the oceanic in the beginning as a kind of analytical, you know, sort of, um, you know, as a kind of analytic, as a kind of uh, provocation, if you will, right, as a kind of historical and philosophical provocation. But then it also, I think, becomes important to think about those other sites where age is undone. And part of that has to do with thinking about the entirety of enslavement, right? So that would include the first passage. What happened during that particular passage that might have undone what girlhood is, right? Mm -hmm. She completely disappears in the narrative. We can only conjecture 
whether or not she followed a kind of path toward the, the new world, whether she stays in, on the continent in Africa. And she's a mystery in this way, a historical mystery, right? We don't know how to think of her girlhood because we don't know which trajectory she followed. And so in that sense, I kind of want to think of those moments where the question of how we think of age or we think of the undoing of it is very much a project that has to do with rethinking particular historical events or processes, right? We think of boyhood, perhaps, or girlhood, perhaps because of the way they become legible through particular historical processes. How, if we think about age as an analytic, do we then have to rethink what those processes were comprised of? May I say, in fact, I, I just feel like I must say that in that very section, when you are working with um, the a quote Equiano girl and making it so clear, I think, to me at least, that you want us to really hear, like even when you're using that, that phrase, right, the Equiano girl, to hear what is undone, it's in that very section when you deliver one of the sentences that I love so much because there are too many that I could share, but I just want to uh, very quickly say part of this sentence, in the pace of, in the pace of history, there is no time to say her name. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's, and isn't that still true, right? I mean, how often do we say her? How often is she remarked upon, right? So she's well, present and she's so mind blowing is that this is this text that has been, you know, read into the ground. <laughs> and yet, until now, we've never stopped to linger That's right. on that girl, that girl, and to wonder about her story. I mean, for me, Habiba, as the historian, as someone who's a little bit empirical, <laughs> um, I mean, what what is daunting about the project is precisely that it's it takes on so much. I mean, it's it's a big thing to theorize how central age is to Western modernity and its imagining of the human subject. And yet it's so, you, you make it so obvious that I sit here thinking, okay, but how didn't we know this already? Because it just, it's just so, so persuasive. And, you know, as someone who studies the slave trade, I'm really blown away to be made to think about how much age has to be understood alongside gender, right? As, as, as co-equal with gender as these technologies of embodiment that are central to Western humanism and how the Atlantic, the oceanic, the slave trade, the slave ship is indeed this place where you know, to return to your reading of schoolers, I feel like we have begun to understand how the slave trade relied on a distortion, uh, how racialization relied on a distortion of gender. But it's just so profound to, to be made to, to reckon with how clear it is that it also relied on a distortion of, of age, right? And, and I mean, I, I would put it, not even so much as about undifferentiating as much as differently differentiating, redifferentiating. I mean, I think part of what's so powerful about what racial capitalism is, is able to produce in the context of the slave trade is this ability to, I mean, your, your language about rendering the black body as, you know, a blank slate, I think is just so compelling there, right? Because it becomes, I think, this blankness on which racial capitalism can project its fantasies, right? And they're fantasies that require a fluidity with regard to, to gender and age that require the black body to be all things and everything, right? With regard to otherwise normative 
ordered stagings of age, right? So the, the black female body can be both reproductive um, and capable of labor equal to that of a man, right? All in the same moment, all in the same capacity. Um, and it, it, it's telling that what the slave trade logic relies on is precisely a discourse around gender and age, right? In the sense that to the extent that the slave trade does require an economic logic that assigns value, differential value to these humans as they're being commodified, it is about projections around gender and age, right? In every slave ship ledger, the humans are reduced to being either male or female, either adults or children, either you know, woman or girl. But, but these are precisely categories that are evacuated, as you rightly point out, of social meaning, right? It's an entirely you know, fantasy logic uh, for, for projecting, right? Western imaginings of what you can do to, to fully consume the labor power you know, of these humans. And so as someone who does deal in this realm of the political economic and the empiricism of the slave trade, that's why I'm kind of like, okay, you're saying, yeah, I get it. You're not, you know, you're not a sociologist. You're not doing an empirical study, but you are making really, really powerful claims um, and, and connecting what you find in the Black literary imagination to very empirical questions that in, in ways that are just um, just mind-blowing and, and beautiful, and for which I'm I'm really grateful. But I wanna we we can you don't have to answer this question now, but while I, I'm going to get it in here while I can, one of the things I'd love for you to talk about at some point is that what I didn't expect in the book, um, in your framing of the book, is what becomes a genealogy of Black studies um, as, as an intellectual project. And so I wonder if you could say something about why that became so important to your understanding of the scope of the project. In other words, I expected a kind of theorization of, of your categories. I didn't expect the genealogy of Black studies itself to be so central. And so I wonder if you could say something about that. Yeah, now, thank you. Yeah, I'll do, yeah, right, right. I mean, why not just answer that tremendous question, Stephanie? Thank you. And thank you for, I mean, in a sense, like, you, the fact that you do work on the political, political economy of the slave ship has been really important for the work I was able to do on this book, right? So in a sense, when it comes to the way that you describe in the British trade, how bodies are thought of in terms of tax brackets, right? Or thought of in terms of size, which is then taxable in particular ways. They're not thought of, these numbers, are not about whether someone can read, right? Or whether someone is able to, you know, master a particular skill or whether someone has adult teeth, right? These numbers are very much about taxes and, you know, commodification. So, you know, that empirical work is definitely the, the, the grist for the mill for the imagining that, you know, I was able to do and others do, you know, in literary studies. So you know, it's, there really shouldn't be a methodological separation as I think we all agree. And so to the other, to your question about the development of black studies, you know, because this project was really so much a part of really attempting to account for the present in, you know, sort of historical and philosophical ways, I really had to think about why the present moment in black studies has turned to slavery. I mean, in some ways, you know, I'm reading work by Morrison and Ernest Gaines, who I think we need to read more of, and Octavia Butler and Equiano, right? I mean, in a sense, I'm reading contemporary for the most part, right? I also read Uncle Tom's Cabin. In a sense, I'm kind of responding to the turn in the field 
toward transatlantic slavery and then also kind of accounting for my own formation through that preoccupation as a scholar right so in that sense there was already a roadmap that i could follow to explore the historical preconditions for the present moment right because the field is already you know so interested in the turn towards slavery and so I wanted to kind of get into where that turn came from, right? And so in some ways, it's not, you know, we're, we've talked about age in a number of ways. We've talked about it in terms of the slave ship, in terms of what it meant for enslavement, right? But age also had to do with the way that some scholars in the academy, particularly Black women feminist scholars during the 70s and 80s, particularly the 80s, right, who are now shaping the field, but are also being disciplined in particular ways. And so I kind of wanted to think of the development of Black studies as being forged through the ways that the scholars who are shaping it are experiencing not only their own gendered subject position, but also their own experience of time. So, you know, what if that turn toward enslavement, which then allows us to think about gender in particular ways as Spillers does, right? Spillers is part of this turn. Spillers gives us a way to think about gender because she's able to go back to the transatlantic slave trade, but maybe she's also able to do this because time is feeling conspicuously out of joint in the 1980s. That when you're a black feminist scholar working in the academy, and number one, you're beginning to shape the field in ways that are unprecedented, right? And at least in, you know, traditionally closed off institutional spaces. But at the same time, you're also being told that your discernments, the critical objects that you're interested in reading, your reading practices don't matter, also come with this sense of being disciplined in the way that perhaps children are disciplined in relationship to adults. So, you know, I kind of refer to this moment in 1987 in the pages of uh, a journal that really epitomizes how this works, right? So if you're of a certain generation of scholar, right, you might kind of remember that post-structuralism was becoming the kind of dominant sort of epistemological framework for thinking about reading literary texts, right? That theory, robust, masculinist theory, right, the stuff of real intellectuals was becoming kind of dominant in the in at least literary studies, right, in particular other humanistic studies. And in some ways, the question had to do with what thinking about continental theory might do for the reading of Black literary texts. And so when it came to Black feminist scholars who raised this question, in order to say that reading practices that aren't explicitly or in any way perhaps drawn from continentalist theory can still be theoretical, right? So we can think of Barbara Christian's The Race for Theory, right? Kind of making this case that as she speaks about her own Black feminist reading practices, she's not relinquishing the fact that what she's doing is in some ways theorizing. She's just saying that the epistemological basis for theory isn't co is coming from a different location, right? So Joyce A. Joyce says this in that contentious battle she has with Skip Gates and Houston Baker, right? The two pioneers of uh, post-structuralist theory in the 1980s in Black studies. So I kind of wanted to think of this turn to slavery being in some way connected with Black feminist scholars really seeing themselves as, again, having achieved a kind of professional status and in some ways understanding that they've, you know, been able to, you know, kind of become a presence in the field in ways that 
might seem like the fulfillment of something. And yet at that moment, they're also experiencing this hierarchy of concerns, right? And so I wanted to sort of think of age in that sense. When it comes to how we think about the development of hierarchies and the lines of force that they produce, how do we think about that in ways that don't draw us toward the conventional categories through which we're used to thinking about hierarchies? I mean, so we could think about what I've just described in terms of masculine theory, feminist criticism, the battle between black scholars was really gendered. And that's the narrative that you know, I certainly inherited, right? That was sort of the way in which it was discussed often. But what if we thought about the hierarchical production as it happens in institutional spaces as being one that could be just as easily read through the logics of age? And in that sense, that would kind of give us a way to understand, well, what were these Black feminists thinking of when they went to thinking about alternative versions of time, right? So if they're thinking about like, why am I being disciplined in a way that makes me feel as if, you know, I'm infantilized, right? Why am I being infantilized in a space where my discernments are actually shaping the field, right? Wouldn't that maybe have something to do with thinking about a character like Beloved, who in some ways is not a girl, Right? She's in history, but she's out of history in terms of being recognizable through the categories that we have for thinking about age. Would it have something to do with the way that we think about, you know, incidents of the life in the slave girl and the way that text was reread by the time that, you know, um, we kind of get the, you know, the, uh, we, we're, you know, when we know that that was an autobiographical text and not a fictional text. When we're able to read that text as a problem of black girlhood, wouldn't that have something to do with the way in which black feminist scholars who you know, take up that text later on are interested in the fact that being gendered and being racialized also means being in a position of feeling time differently? Right? Like in a sense, when we think about black girlhood studies now as it's growing, there's something about blackness and gender and perhaps blackness and female gender or blackness and gender as ungendered that draws us to this question of what does it mean to be in time? And so I kind of wanted to think about the development of, this is the very, very long answer. I wanted to kind of think about the development of the field or imagine the development of the field as being one that was impacted by scholars who were really seriously grappling with the fact that here we are in the 1980s, we're not actually any more liberated than we were. In fact, perhaps we're less liberated. The feminist movement is behind us. We have a curricular object instead of a movement, right? In a sense, time must have felt conspicuous in very particular ways, right? And did that have something to do with the turn toward the historical past and the turn toward enslavement in particular? So it's one of those epigraphs that I use in the beginning of the book where Morrison's talking to Paul Gilroy. And, you know, she says, because of course this is the 1980s, right? Where postmodernist aesthetics are also really dominant. She's saying that like, while, you know, our, my, my white writerly colleagues can turn to the, the postmodern and think about surface rather than depth. But when it comes to the preoccupations of black writers, we're interested in thinking historically, right? Why would black women after the 1970s feel compelled to really engage this question of time in ways that were urgent and in ways that were unconventional? So, I mean, I hope it answers the question, but, you know, I kind of really wanted to sort of get at what, you know, the, the precondition for the development of the field was. Thank you so much, Aviva. I wanted you to, I wanted to hear you talk about that because I just think it's such a wonderful, I mean, it's just yet another layer to the book that just is full of richness and insight. And as I said, it's, I, for me, at least, it was it was an unexpected gift, and so I just wanted to 
to hear you kind of say more about what what led you to uh, to make that such a central piece of your your own framing and your own sense of what's at stake for the book and, and how you came to it. So thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you for asking. I appreciate it. I mean, I could say more about it. I mean, in a sense, right? Because like Spillers is like the, she's the anchor in this book, right? And the way that she writes Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe is really a response to this, you know, sort of demand for post-structuralist framings, right? And in a sense, she's writing in a way that responds to that. I mean, she's writing for, you know, an audience that is in some ways thinking about a kind of um, new set of standards for theoretical framings of, you know, cultural work. She's responding to that, but she's also saying, you know, at the same time, you know, I'm going to do a different kind of theorizing with your language, right? And I'm going to do it in a way that defamiliarizes the way that you think, right? You as a, she's also speaking to, to like varying audiences, right? Which was the, the gift that black feminist, you know, critics of that generation did, right? They were speaking to the post-structuralists who may have dominated the field of literary studies in the 1980s, but they were also speaking to black feminists who could hear them on a different register, right? And so in that sense, does that like tell us something about the way they experienced time, right? that Spillers is able to say, I'm on your time. I can speak your language, right? I can do what you're doing. I understand the influences and sources and preoccupations that you have. I can also say something that you can't actually imagine, right? I mean, in a sense, it's, it's the way that she's kind of speaking in those varying voices that has a lot to do with saying, I'm gonna give you an account of time. I'm gonna give you another account of time. And I'm gonna give you one that perhaps you can track through the texts I'm telling you. And I'm gonna give you an account that is going to challenge you to imagine a whole other way of being human. And she's doing it at the same time. You know, so. And she's yeah. doing it, but she's doing it at the same time as Morrison. I think you are surely right. Think about how then 1987, the simultaneity, right, of Mama Babies, Papas Maybe, and Beloved, right? So to think about flesh, right? And both of those registers, both the flesh that Baby Suggs is, is delivering and the flesh that Horton Spillers is delivering. So I agree entirely. <laughs> Right. I mean, in a sense, it's both. And like, you know, to, to think about just, you know, also Beloved coming out of the Black Book of the 1970s, right, that there is a kind of recovery project in Beloved, right, that comes out of Black feminists and feminist scholars generally wanting to say, we need to go back to something historical in order to say something about, you know, how we've come to be, right. So in a sense, I kind of think of you know, the, the turn to flat right in Beloved and in Spillers in 1987, there is a kind of what is this substance of our humanity and how exactly do we account for it? What is the language that's going to give us an account, right? We have to invent it. And they're doing it in, in tremendously different ways, but they're doing it at the same time. And the question is why, right? What exactly is happening for that generation that allows them to be as audacious and inventive when it comes to you know imagining the outcomes of a different modernity because that's exactly what they're doing right it's a different western modernity that they're imagining and accounting for why are they also, doing it at the time you right? know one of the things you also gesture toward is the, you know, the ruse of the promise of black bourgeois liberal belonging. And, you know, I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking, you know, the late 1980s is arguably also a moment of reckoning with the failed promise of, of post-civil rights affirmative action, you know, kind of uh, inclusion 
particularly for black women, black feminist women in particular. So that also kind of something interesting for me at least to think about. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that it's sort of like the Obama moment, right? There's this moment uh, that we're, there's this aspiration or there's a, a supposed aspiration that attends to proper bourgeois subjectivity. And then there's a sense, a kind of nominal fulfillment of that promise. And then with that comes a, a, a kind of break, right? So if, you know, you kind of get to the sense like, well, here we are, we have the largest population of middle-class black subjects, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps that we've had in history. Here we are in institutional spaces that we've never been included in before, right? And yet, and yet, and yet, right? So like those moments, right? Where there's a kind of opportunity to think about what exactly is being opened up that gives us space to think about how the present has been constituted is precisely where the project goes. And in both of those moments, these black feminists who are like, where's the movement? Oh, we're in the academy, <laughs> right? Or the moment where it's kind of like, we have a black president. Why are black children being killed, right? In a sense, those moments allow us to think about like what exactly have our investments been blinding us to and what new vocabularies do we need in order to see a completely new path toward another way of being, toward new aspirations. Well, I want to thank you also for uh, reading at your opening today um, the passage that you read. I, I laughed out loud because it was a passage that I underlined in entirety and just wrote in the marginalia. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, it just, um, there are many, many moments where in the book where I have nothing to say in the margins except wow but that was that was one of them i just habiba this book is so many things at once it is uh it is an intellectual genealogy it is a profound philosophical treatise and it is a we haven't talked about this as much but i mean it is also a um a radically hopeful um, provocation and, and celebration, right? I mean, and you talk early on about a dialectic of the ways that age is a tool of, uh, by, by which Western liberalism it, it, it produces blackness as outside of temporality, normative temporality, but you immediately insist that there is also a responsive Black reclaiming, reworking, um, and so there, that there is a dialectic tension. So it's not a monolithic narrative of the violences of racial capitalism, even as it is an incredibly insightful diagnosis of that. Um, and so I have just, you know, I, I applaud you and I'm grateful to you for the ways in which you have, you've, you've just poured so much and there's just so much to take um, from this, from this beautiful, beautiful book. Thank you so much. May I echo that? I want to echo that, Habiba, because I think in so many ways, in terms of what you're doing with the untimely, because there are moments throughout the book when you use untimely to even, for example, talk about the violence of that term boy being used to describe men, right? But then there's also, and I am really echoing exactly what you're saying, Stephanie, in terms of how the book 
opens up a certain way to understand how this uh, untimeliness, you know, how it does something for us, how it can help Black people imagine otherwise, right? And imagine, as you said earlier, these different ways of being human, because then I think those resonant phrases that linger for me, you know, words like, um, thick with numerous temporalities as you're describing, you know, at Tuskegee and then uh, the syphilis study and the ways in which then you tell us that uh, those men who are made part of that violent uh, study, that they're actually thick with these uh, uh, numerous temporalities, uh, your exact words, that sense that then when we think about this untimeliness, even along the lines of what you also phrase as, if, if I remember correctly, it's something like entangled with time. And I also hold on to that when I think about your final flourish, when you think about what it would mean to imagine a different type of maturity, right? Because that really made me pause as well. I thought, wait, wait, uh, you know, what would that? I think then that clearly that's your point, right? To have us pause, right? And think about how we would have to really think, um, as you suggest in your opening, some kind of maturity that's surely outside of patriarchal adulthood. And I think that that's a different way, right, of being entangled with time. So absolutely, I think that is also part of the force of this book, right, is that you're actually opening up this way in which then your terms, and I think especially um, by all means, this term um, untimely, right, how it becomes a way of thinking about how, um, you you know, Abib, of course, the, this question I've been using, what time is it when you're Black, right? So the answer becomes, well, untimely. <laughs> That's right. Yes. And your work is speaking right to that question. In a sense, it's it to be untimely is, a, a, it's an allurement, right? I mean, it's, it's something that gives us an opportunity to imagine, you know, like not just the way untimeliness is thought of in its abusive valences. It gives us a way of thinking about how we can exist in, in time scales that haven't been imagined. If we're thinking of time as something other than developmental in conventional ways or evolutionary in conventional ways or legal in conventional ways or political in conventional ways, then we'd have to think about what it means to be in time if we're not thinking about liberal political economic rationalities if we're not thinking about you know the sort of scientific discourse of evolution and the way that tracks on to biological development on an individuated scale but also a species scale right if we're not thinking about development in terms of the way that it's been constituted to shore up a particular version of human in Western discourses and in Western knowledges, then we really do have to kind of think about what does it mean to have a connection to a different relation to time, right? And that is exactly the project, right? It's, you know, it's like imagining, you mentioned the top of this talk, right? Kevin Quash's work, who, which, you know, I, really appreciate and find so generative, right? It's that idea of being with in varying ways, right? Because if you're in time differently, I mean, of course, you know, I'm going to be the first to acknowledge that, you know, feminist scholars in American studies, in queer studies, you know, in age studies, right, have thought about the way that gender and time work differently, right? So white women haven't been granted adulthood in the same schedule of rights as men, right? So this isn't, so we have like a body of work that's acknowledged this, but what if we didn't think about, you know, a kind of, you know, sort of standard, which always upholds the liberal subject par excellence as the aspirational subject toward which we should move, right? What if we did away with that? And then where would we go, right? And so it's a, it's a way of thinking about relationality as well. How would we relate to each other in terms of solidarity projects, in terms of shared investments, in terms of the way we can think about shared histories, right? So it is a provocation. I'm hoping that the project 
leads to other projects, right? Sometimes the writing is a little suggestive and really it's because I'm hoping others can pick it up and run with it. And so I hope that this is something that we can continue to think about, you know, as a collective generally. I'm really hoping that it's taken as the gift that it's intended to be. Well, thank you so much to, to um, Habiba Ibrahim and to Stephanie Smallwood and Margot Natalie Crawford for such a enlightening, wonderful engagement with this work. Um, the book is Black Age. There's lots in here for scholars. There's so much in here for people that don't consider themselves scholars. And I would encourage everybody to pick up a copy of this book if you haven't. Um, and I apologize for our technical difficulties in the beginning, but um, you are all you are all wonderful tonight, and um, I hope that you'll be able to join us again someday. Um, I think that um, this is going to to um, stimulate some some additional scholarship um, in in a variety of fields. So, thank you very much. And, um, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba, for this gift. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, everyone at Atelier Day. Thank you. <laughs>